uh, government that the government uh, institutions uh, are established all the ministries and uh, the bureaucracy is established the main like national institutions they are all basically established in the capital of norway in christiania uh, we should also mention the supreme court uh, before 1814, the Supreme Court was uh, uh, sitting in Copenhagen in Denmark uh, with the, the new nation, uh, national institutions. Norway got its own Supreme Court in uh, Christiania. As I mentioned, it was the king that kind of kept then the union together. So I just mention that here too so the institutions they were independent uh of course especially in, when it comes to the government the king had some influence on it uh he appointed it what also happens during the uh, 19th century is that this uh, the cabinet uh, basically becomes a self-recruiting body that the king basically just followed the advice of the cabinet every time it, a new minister was to be appointed. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, Carl Johan more also had more influence on it, but this is kind of a pretty clear process that the government itself kind of decides who they want to recruit. Okay, I will close the sharing again then. Um, so if we see then on the national level, the political level, the institutions that were made, it is pretty clear that the, the, the events of 1814 and also including the new union with Sweden introduced very very important institutions on the national level and it was a, a big change from the situation that had been before both in terms of political system a constitutional monarchy and big and in terms of establishing national autonomous more or less autonomous institutions however, however and that now we will move to the local level on the local level and for people's daily life it's, it's probably fair to say that this political change happened on the top and had pretty small consequences. On the local level, the administrative structure uh, from before 1814, during the Danish kingdom, was largely kept at it, as it was before. Locally, the priest continued to be the most influential civil servants and chief administrator of the community. In the 18th century, um, uh, during the 18th century, the number of uh, lower local public offices accessible for farmers had increased with the establishment of a school system from 1739 and uh, offices such as peace commissioners, that was an institution that was to take off some pressure of the court system and here it was appointed like people with also peasant background there were also tradition a traditional uh also traditional local public offices such as the local sheriff or police um who was always recruited from the peasant population and also the clock uh, in the church i think the uh, you can translate it with kind of a, a sexton. It's basically the assistant of the priest in the church that also was usually appointed from the local peasant population. Uh, however, the priest played an important part in all local structures. And all of this continued, uh, as I said, as it was before, after 1814. And at least for about uh, two decades and also uh, many places for a longer uh, time. What fundamentally, when the fundamental change here starts, that is in 1837, 
with the so-called uh, Formanskapslova in Norwegian, or I, I'm a bit unsure how to translate it, chairmanship laws that basically establishes a local body that is elected locally and kind of elect its own mayor and we kind of get an administrative structure on the local level that is kind of representative. Until then, it was basically no representative structures uh, on the local uh, level. Um, to add to this picture of what did not change, the laws from before 1814 was all kept as they were before, after 1814. The constitution was basically added on the top of what was already there from before. So during the Danish monarchy, it has been introduced a lot of laws by the king. All of this was kept. And of course, you, you see, it was necessary to keep it because, I mean, you couldn't kind of just, uh, you couldn't kind of just uh, uh, not having these laws anymore. So you kind of had to make a gradual change. So, but all of these laws were kept. The constitution, however, said there should be made a new common law for the kingdom. But instead, the parliament gradually sanctioned law on more limited fields. And in 1840s, it abandoned the idea of a common civil and criminal law. Uh, however, a new Supreme Court was established in Christiania, but the rest of also uh, the legal system was kept as before, uh, consisting of an appeal system from the local level and district judges, uh, district judges in, on the countryside and uh, another structure kind of similar in the cities and regional courts, uh, appeal courts, and then the Supreme Court. So also in the, the judicial system, uh, many things basically looked as before in the years after 1814. Also in the economic, economic field, there was little change. The constitution of 1814 stated that no new economic privileges should be issued by the state. But all the old ones remained as they were uh, in 1814, and then gradually some were uh, taken away in the years after. Uh, but it was only later that it, this really changes. Um, it was only later in the century that the parliament abolished most of the regulation that it inherited from the old state. Um, it, the process of economic liberalization of the system of the, where the state had in, before 1814 given privileges, which basically meant that they, you needed kind of a royal sanction, uh, uh, the, the government had to, and the king in principle had to kind of give you the right to do businesses, most businesses and things like that. So the liberalization of this, uh, the economy basically started in the 1840s, uh, where a process of economic liberalization did start. Um, yes. So we can uh, ask at this point, was it, what, uh, did anything change at all? on the local level, or was it basically all like before? Yes, some things did change. And most importantly, uh, it, cha it was changed when it came to, come to the question of peasants' involvement in national politics. And in particular, the peasants uh, uh, that they, uh, in particular, that the peasants also participated in the national elections. With the constitution, the peasants got the right to vote and participate in the political processes on the national process on the national level. Uh, surely, this participation in the election process uh, that consisted uh, from having to swear loyalty to constitution in uh, the constitution in district. Uh, courts to the elections, election of electors, 
for district assemblies that then again elected the members of parliament made the peasant population in Norway feel that they participated in an, in these new national institutions that were established in 1814. Some of the peasants even became members of parliament. But we should also notice that on the other side, we do know that many farmers did not make full use of the rights that were given to them in 1814 uh, to vote, and, it, and that they only used this right later on in the 19th century. It's probably many reasons for this. One is probably that they were they basically trusted whoever was going to be elected, not least local civil servants and priests and so on. Um, it should also be mentioned that even though many peasants got the right to vote, uh, there were there was still a lot of people on the countryside and not least in the cities. Uh, that did not own land or property, and that for that reason was ex excluded from the right to vote. Mm -hmm. So uh, even though we can say that a rather high percentage of the male population was given the right to vote, there is still a lot of people who did not get that right. Uh, both in 1814 and the years to come, the countryside often elected civil servants as representatives to the parliament. Recent studies, be, studies being made on these elections show clear tendencies that those elected uh, to uh, the assemblies on regional level, it, the system worked like this, that to be elected for parliament, you first had to be elected for a regional uh, assembly that then again elected the members of parliament. It was like a two-step uh, system, you can say. Um, so those that were elected to these regional assemblies, uh, they belonged, uh, more, many of them at least, belonged to an elite in the farmer society or peasant society. In general, they were wealthier than most peasants. Uh, and we also see that many of them were holding local offices and positions such as sheriffs or lensmen, teachers or peace commissioners. They, uh, they could also be recognized as persons with skills in the economic field running some kind of small scale business, for example, or in other ways that they were seen on as people with uh, cultural knowledge, uh, read like many of them could read, uh, but kind of that they had more knowledge than most people. In short, we see elements of a class structure also in the peasant society, uh, affecting both the participation in the elections and the outcome of who were elected. Now we'll take a, try to take a deeper look into the issue of the social structures. Um, not the constitution of 1814, nor the events in 1814, challenged the basic social structures in the Norwegian society. The civil servants and the class of merchants that I do not talk so much about here, but I could talk more about, continued to form the elite of the Norwegian uh, country, the Norwegian nation. The peasants and population of the lower social classes continued to be commoners, even though many of them owned their land and some even was quite wealthy and or held local public uh, offices. The introduction of uh, the right to vote still gave the peasants more political rights, meeting and uh, conducting negotiations with members of the elite in regional election assemblies for parliament. But so the meeting points became more common between the different social classes but it was still a clear understanding of class difference in the Norwegian society. I'm sorry, now I have to uh, find my ways in my manuscript here.
Um, all right, there we go. But after 1814, still some members of the peasant elite also moved upwards in the political system. And as members, and as mentioned, and as I mentioned, some even became members of parliament, but let's just say that no one became ministers in the cabinet. That was something that was basically exclusively uh, civil servants who made that career. Uh, but still we see the formation of an elite also among the peasants uh, that made use of the advantage uh, of their political rights. While the formation of such an elite was important in terms of making political expertise and knowledge, it is very important to also notice that the new rights in some ways probably strengthened class difference in, this, in the countryside. This is because difference between those having the right to vote and those who didn't, those who kind of were inside and those who were outside the political, the political system became even more obvious than it had been before. Because now after 1814, you could clearly see who, on the, in, who of the peasants that could take part in the political process and who on the countryside that didn't own their land, that maybe because they, uh, for example, were tenant farmers and so on, uh, or maids, uh, well, women didn't have the right to vote anyway, but uh, uh, male uh, laborers, they did not have the right to vote. So it became kind of very obvious for people who had that right and who didn't have that right. This kind of even more awareness about class difference was strengthened by the population growth that became pretty high in the, uh, that became high in the uh, 19th century. And until the middle of the 19th century, the consequence of the rapid population growth was a growth in the lower classes in the Norwegian country uh, side. This is seen in the system of tenant farmers in Norwegian called husmen. That means basically farmers who did uh, not own their own land, but got a plot of land, a piece of land from a, uh, from a peasant that owned his land. And they could kind of uh, have some agriculture there, but not enough to live of. Uh, and maybe had to either pay a rent for the place or they had to work on the uh, farmer's uh, land to pay for uh, living there. So this is kind of the husman, or I think usually it's translated with tenant farmers. And this system in Norway, it did not decrease after 1814, but it increased and it peaked in 18, around 1855, the middle of the 1850s, for then starting to go down again. So it was not until the second half of the 19th century that internal migration in Norway from the countryside to the cities and emigration to America led to that this situation kind of changed where many of the poorer people of the countryside kind of migrated either internally in Norway or abroad. But in, until the middle of the century, the population growth basically just meant that you got more poor people in the countryside because the numbers of farms did not really increase a little bit, but not really so much. It was limited resources. So, what then about uh, this Norwegian elite I've already been talking quite a lot about, the civil servants, uh, to look at the other side of the coin. The strength of the Danish-Norwegian Union in many ways showed itself after it ended in 1814, uh, in the, the way that the culture of the old Union to a large extent still existed in Norway in the 19th century. This was not least true because of the position of the civil servants. They became the leader. They had been the king's servants in Norway before 1814, uh, running basically the administrative system in Norway. Um, 
and they became the most important and dominant political and also socially group social group in Norway after 1814. They became the leaders of the Norwegian state, but many of them, especially in the decades after 1814, was educated in Denmark. Norway didn't get its own university until 1813, just before the end of uh, the union. Uh, and many of these civil servants had got their positions under the old regime, and many of them had both friends and family roots in Denmark. Uh, the, their idea of government culture and culture largely lent on their background uh, from this old regime. So this is kind of, even though the institution changes, this kind of uh, dominant elite still in many ways has, they, they at least have their background in the old regime. The domination of the civil servants of the Norwegian state was maybe one of the most striking features of uh, the new Norwegian state after 1814. And here, now I will try to say something about who these people were, because it is important to notice that when I speak about civil servants here, it is not really a precise term. In Norwegian, we have a term called embetsman, which basically means a, a servant, like a, a servant that is appointed by the king. Uh, but the civil servants, why, is, why I say it's not precise is because this administrative elite was not only civil, it also included the religious, uh, the religious institutions, the church organization with its bishops and its priests. That was very, very important in how the administration of the Norwegian uh, local and regional uh, community was uh, done, basically. It, beside the, the civil servants uh, of the state and the, the, the religious, uh, uh, the priests and the bishops, it also included military officers and all officers of the legal systems, all judges on all levels. Uh, judges from the local level all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and it, uh, after 1814, also included a growing body of civil servants in the ministries, in, in particular in, uh, in uh, Christiania, in Oslo, in the national bureaucracy. Uh, uh, that belonged kind of to the cabinet or the government. It is also very important to say that, like, how did these people become so dominant and so powerful? And to explain that, it is important to know that these, I will still call them civil servants then, uh, represented the state on all kinds of levels. It was in the government offices, but also on the local and regional level. You had the judges, you had the priests, that was basically located more out in the countryside uh, on the local level. Uh, until 1884, when it was a, a, a political regime change, uh, the civil servants also tom totally dominated the government is itself, as I already mentioned. And it was also the dominating group in the parliament because the peasants, to a large extent, also elected them as their representative, at least until the 1830s. But also after that, they kept kind of a very strong presence in the parliament. In the first decades after 1814, the opposition to these civil servants and elite was very limited. But still, we do see some uh, tendencies of opposition. In 1818, peasants marched on parliament to make them change taxation policy. But it is in the 1830s, we begin to really see a shift. Um, and it had, uh, is connected to the issue of introducing a new, new system of local governments. Uh, this issue of local governments became kind of a hot potato in national politics. Now the peasants for the first time started to use their voting rights. 
and they gave their votes to people from their own class background and not anymore to that extent to uh, people belonging to the elite. Actually, in the discussion leading up to the 1832 elections, which then led to the parliament in uh, that was gathered in 1833, there was plenty of accusations about civil servants for misuse of their positions. And these accusations also took uh, present in the public and in some newspapers. Uh, in this very pro-peasant, to call it, give it that name, agitation leading up to the parliament elections in 1832, um, a, uh, a person called Junego from Rumstal on the west coast published a book that was called the Ula book, which basically be, be, consists of a dialogue between four persons and kind of telling what people should vote and let's say he didn't tell them to vote for their local priest he told them to vote for uh, people they could trust as he would have said and that meant people that belonged to their own class for peasant all the peasants he came in this book also with pretty harsh attacks uh, on the civil servants for misuse uh, of their positions and not protecting the interests of the common people. And the same kind of argument was also present in a pretty radical newspaper called the Staatsborger or the Citizen. Uh, and uh, in this newspaper, it was also printed lists of who the editor considered good people to vote for. And uh, the court system actually, uh, the, they, they actually uh, closed this newspaper down, to say it in an easy way, uh, after a while, because they meant that the editor was uh, basically too radical and that he kind of tried to involve himself in elections in a way that he shouldn't and so on. Anyway, for the first time, the elections of 1832 led to that there were elected more far peasants than civil servants to the parliament that gathered in 1833. Uh, at this parliament session, it was already planned to discuss the formation of a new structure for local and regional institutions in Norway, uh, which basically had the ambition to involve locals to a larger degree and also then peasants and other commoners that had the right to vote, that is too important to say. The government's suggestion uh, was uh, that was uh, for this new institutions that was presented for the parliament uh, was however giving very limited autonomy to the new institutions. And with a majority in hand, the oppositions led by also several far peasants was opposing this suggestion. And the result was a compromise in parliament that was much more radical than what the, gov the cabinet had suggested. Uh, but this was, uh, after it was, uh, uh, it passed in parliament, uh, the king basically vetoed uh, the whole uh, law so that it was put on hold. Well, and this was one of the powers that the king had that he could veto uh, laws, at least temporary. Uh, however, in the next parliament in 1837, a more moderate version of these laws for local government was passed. The laws of local government that was passed in 1837 can hardly be underestimated in their importance. The law established local boards. Uh, in Norwegian, it's called Formanskap. I'm unsure again about the, I'm sorry about that, about the translation to English, but maybe you can call it something like a chairmanship or something like that, chairman, board of chairmen. Um, uh, and also a representative uh, institution beside this uh, more kind of limited uh, board for the local community. Um, the Formanskap elected then the mayor of the local community. And the mayor also served as representative in a regional institution 
on a county level. So it was established not only like a local new body, but also a regional new body that had kind of the represent that consisted of representatives of all the um, municipalities inside the county. So a totally new system of local government is introduced. And the principle in this system is basically, you can say bottom up, like uh, to, at least to a certain extent that in a way it was elected from down, it was not appointed from above. Um, in the very beginning after 1837, it was quite common that civil servants or the local priest was elected mayors in their municipalities. But soon most mayors began to come from peasant background or uh, similar. In this way, the new local uh, institutions became power centers for representatives from common background. Uh, and the new institutions could also be new stepping stones for national political careers. Uh, and we will see that later on in the uh, 19th century that many of the members of parliament that comes from peasant background and not least the political leaders and leadership that develops during the second half of the 19th century, many of these people from that background, they come they have the background from these local municipalities and many of them have been mayors uh, in their local municipalities. Um, still, uh, in on the larger scale, the hegemony, hegemony of the civil servants continued in Norway until 1884. They, until then they kept the dominance totally of the cabinet and the, the kind of government institutions, except to a certain extent the parliament. Um, but in 1884, the political regime changed and the, the liberal and peasant friendly party Venstre came to power. Uh, but the, uh, the events of the 1830s also influenced politics uh, of government of uh, the government in other ways and underlined the necessity for the political leadership to pay attention to the interest of common people. Uh, however, this importance should not be exaggerated either. It was strong liberal elements uh, also among the political elite uh, and in particular about economic politics. So here it's kind of a dialogue between where the elites also respond to kind of needs, but also have their own liberal ideas and this, led to that from the 1840s on new laws uh, were passed uh, that basically demolished the old economic system of privileges and opened up for a much more market oriented economy. This had not least huge consequences for the countryside where it, to say it's simple basically became much more easy to do business. Before uh, these uh, regulate uh, before these new laws, there were regulations basically saying that to run a, a shop in any of any kind on the countryside was very difficult because the the, the privileges of doing trade belong to the cities, things like that. But this changed pretty rapidly from the 1840s, 50s on. Uh, also in the field of religion, the old system of one church was abandoned and in 1842 it became possible for, to gather congregations without the acceptance of the local priest. And this is some of the background for the first uh, in 20, like uh, emigration to America that they kind of the meek, they are religiously oppressed but uh, from the 1840s on, this also is loosened up uh, as a system. There is, uh, it's easier to have um, different kinds of religious um, views. Okay, I see I have soon actually kept on for 45 minutes and I think I will uh, try to close my lecture here and uh, then I hope there are some discussions. I think I saw someone writing in the chat and I deliberately did not 
look at it because I was so into my own uh, stuff. So I'm sorry about that, but I will definitely look at the questions now. Okay, thank you so far. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jens. That was uh, very interesting. And, and I mean, part of the reason that I am so interested in that period is that um, my great great grandfather was actually a member of the Peasant Storting and then later went back to his hometown and I think became a mayor and was part of the uh, 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 council and so forth. So this was uh, very interesting to get more of a context for how that how that all worked. Thank you. Uh, I see I see here now that maybe you didn't see my PowerPoint with what I did have on the PowerPoint. Did you only yeah. saw the front page all the time? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> Oof, that was embarrassing. Uh, let me just maybe you can just send it to me, and I can I can just yeah. I, I we do it like that. Yeah, no, it's too late anyway. I'm so yeah. sorry. <laughs> I'd just like to share with you um, something from my own family history because your description of the social system sheds some light on why my ancestors came to America. Um, my father um, collected stories from his parents who were both immigrants. And this is what he said about why his father's family left Norway. He said they were a poor country family. Hans, that was my father's father, fell in love with the daughter of a wealthy family. Because of the social class system in Norway, he knew there was no hope of ever marrying her. He was so unhappy, he told his father he was going to leave home and go to America. His father said, if you go, then we will all go. <laughs> <laughs> so they brought the, the four children and uh, his stepmother was a second wife of my great grandfather. And they all came to America and settled in Minnesota. Wow. When was this? 1869. Oh, pretty early. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> That's uh, that's really interesting and a really interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I, uh, I just uh, I also see here that it was a question uh, about the typical duties of the local sheriff, and uh, I can uh, maybe say a few words about that uh, too. It's. Um, I, again, it's this terminology. I was thinking what to translate Lensman. I thought, I think maybe Sheriff is the most uh, reasonable translation. Uh, basically, the Sheriff uh, by law had to be a local peasant. Like the, the author, and this is before 1814 in the Danish uh, times, the, they wanted someone local to kind that kind of had the how can you say deep connection with the local community no, he, that knew the people there to kind of have that position uh, however he was kind of uh, under a civil servant uh, like uh, basically a, a state you can in a way call him a state prosecutor on a regional level that kind of was the boss of all the sheriffs kind of uh, his duties was basically to take uh, uh, like to act on a wide range of law and order issues in society. So he did not involve himself in issues that had to do with the church and morality in principle, things like that. That was more up to the church institutions, but all kinds of, if it was all kinds of crimes, theft, uh, violence, uh, all these kind of issues the local sheriff had to kind of act on and he in some places he might have an assistant or two in other places not depending on the local community but as these were people that were usually re highly regarded in society I mean that was kind of one of the reasons why they were appointed that the authorities considered them people that had good, was trusted people in their communities uh, probably they uh, kind of managed to uh, do what they had to do and uh, fulfill their obligations uh, by also getting help when it was necessary. But it was so, so basically, it, uh, uh, he was the local kind of law and order person, you can say. 
Could you talk a little bit about what the religious atmosphere was before 1842? The religious atmosphere. Yes, um, it is. Um, it is. Uh, it is a very interesting topic. It is. You can say that there is a very like the state uh, after the Reformation in uh, 1536 is basically the Reformation means that uh, the Catholic Church uh, is kicked out of the Danish Norwegian kingdom and the king becomes the head of the church. And that's the reason why kind of the state apparatus, the state bureaucracy, which, which is both has, has both a civil arm, but also a religious arm is kind of merged in one big state. So the connection between the state and the church in Norway before 1814 and also in many ways after 1814, it's actually only very recently that there has been a clear or more or less clear separation It can be discussed between state and, and uh, religion in Norway uh, until re very recently Norway had a so-called state church church. It's only a matter of, I think, 10 years, 20 years ago or something that this was changed. So, but uh, that's a big different story. But so your question about uh, before 1814, it's basically that you can say that the state and the church kind of are very close, closely linked. Um, this meant also that there were, there was basically no tolerance for any other religious groups than those belonging to the state church and very little to tolerance towards alternative interpretations of the doctrine of the state church the doctrine could change a bit sometimes it was more conservative sometimes a bit liberal uh, in the late 18th century we have a lot of pretty liberal priests it's called uh, like they were very influenced influenced by enlightenment uh, ideas uh, they did a lot of the priests are very active when it comes to uh, when it came to writing about the local community nature uh, also doing this kind of things beside the the, the introducing uh, new ways to do agriculture the things outside the purely religious things but when it came to religion, the basic thing was that people had to go uh, a certain number of times every year to take their uh, uh, communion. Is that what it's called in English? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were they kind of kept track on who showed up and who didn't. So most people, and but also to go to church was a place where you got news. Uh, it was the tradition that new uh, instructions, laws, announcements from governments, they were read outside the church on the Sunday. So it was a place for people to also interact and get news and uh, so on. But, my, but the point is, uh, is basically, so you can say the church is very, uh, a very important part of people's life, but the church is also very kind of... Um, it is basically one church and everyone belongs to that church. And this kind of was challenged now and then. It happened, you know, that people had other different religious ideas. And most importantly, in Norway, uh, around 1800, uh, it is a person called Hans Nielsen Hauge. I don't know if any of you might have heard of him. It's recently been published a big book in Norwegian about him. I don't think it's published in English yet. But then also his ideas spread to uh, to uh, America. And it's he uh, uh, later, later on. But uh, there, there was kind of a movement around Hauge that was kind of, uh, very uh, uh, like kind of the, the emphasizing the personal aspect of religion that kind of the, the interaction between the individual and God basically to say try to say it simple and and uh, that meant also kind of it could at least be interpreted 
facilitated as bypassing kind of the priests and the whole religious structure that existed. Yeah. So Hauge's thoughts was for many people in the church, there were some exceptions, but for most of the church, it was considered uh, kind of uh, things that did not want to spread. So Hauge was prosecuted and he was, and uh, when uh, his followers tried to gather congregations, uh, I mentioned this law that was abolished in 1842, this law was put into use you talked about the local uh, sheriff. I read many stories about local sheriffs that has to go out there and uh, and uh, say that you cannot uh, have this uh, congregation. And basically, uh, uh, some people could even be arrested for some time. Hauge ended up being arrested and sat in prison for many years. He was released then after 1814, a bit before that for a short period too. Uh, so basically, you can say that it took some time before the state really kicked down on the Hauge movement. They were probably a bit unsure because he got a lot of followers and they were a bit unsure how to handle it because these people didn't officially break their ties with the church. They kind of continued inside the state church. Also after 18, the Hauge movement consist, existed for in, during the 19th century and after his death even. Uh, but uh, at some point, the Danish um, Norwegian monarchy and uh, state institutions kind of kicked down on uh, his activities and he was arrested. I don't know exactly, maybe some of you know the year he was arrested. I don't remember it exactly now. But uh, it's kind of, it kind of symbolizes for your, your question, it can symbolize that there was a very limited tolerance towards ideas, religious ideas that could be seen as da dangerous for this unity of the state and the church and the kind of mainstream idea about what religion was. And if religious ideas could be seen at, as maybe encouraging some kind of opposition, some kind of ideas that uh, the state didn't really like to be out there, uh, they would use these laws to uh, kick down on it, basically. Uh, yeah, uh, quick question. Uh, what were the educational opportunities for the average uh, Norwegian uh, well, peasant or farm, farm family? Would they have the opportunity to become literate or go to a university? That's a very good question. Uh, it's, um, it uh, depends, of, of course, so when we're talking about. But what is important to notice is that uh, in during the 18th century, to say it very in, gen in general, uh, broadly, uh, a lot of people, maybe even most uh, people, uh, ha were able to read. And this had of course a lot to do with the introduction of uh, the kind of basic school system. It wasn't very developed, but it was kind of a basic education to read uh, in 1739. Uh, the reason for this is about religion, <laughs> back to religion, <laughs> because uh, the state and the church wanted people to be able to read their uh, Bible and uh, their uh, the text, religious text. So the, the and but it's important also to say that this education was about reading, and there were there, it was not introduced that the people necessarily should learn how to write. Mm. That is only happening in the 19th century in the law of 1827. I think it's a new school law coming, and then you introduce also the right the, that they should be taught how to write. Of course, locally there could be variations of this, and we have a. Um, I previously worked at the University College in Volda. I had a colleague there who did Justin Feet, uh, who did uh, some very important studies on reading and writing in Norway in from the 17th century and onwards. And he concluded that there were also writing abilities was pretty common also among the peasant population. And in particular, then in connection with certain families that you can kind of see that some families, they 
they have this interest that they teach their children to read and write and uh, so on. So, so it's pretty common also to write, but uh, not to the extent that reading was common. Of course, still probably not everyone learned how to read. Your question about then education. So, so for the common, uh, for common kids, uh, the possibilities to advance in the education system until uh, quite, uh, yeah, let's say before 1850 was probably pretty limited. Uh, but some did, and many of these who did, did it because some local civil servant, or not least some local priest, saw that these people, and it was then mostly boys, Sorry about that, <laughs> but uh, they they kind of would handpick if they saw that okay this they, they, you know they would teach them for uh, their uh, first communion and so on and and then oh this guy is really talented so they would kind of maybe start giving them in private tutoring and then maybe help financing him to go to uh, further education in cities to uh, what was called real school or something after like this general education and and even go then to the high schools that were present in the cities and that the people could go to which was mostly filled with people from the upper social layers of society but you know they so some people and there it's not uh, uh, you see there are quite some of them that also get this uh, possibility to study and then later on then go to university because of their kind of connections and people helping them. But of course, this is not anything systematic. It's very coincidental. And it's, uh, as I started to say, the possibilities was quite limited. If we then move out in the 19th century and not least on the second half of the 19th century, uh, I will make a point related to what I talked about that, you know, you see these people from peasant and background that uh, become mayors, someone even become members of parliament, someone that make kind of a new career. Some of them get local offices as school holders. The status of school uh, teachers becomes much gradually increases. The status increases during the 19th century. And people with this background, with peasant background, maybe making a political career, maybe becoming mayor, parliament member, uh, maybe get this kind of local offices, not uh, civil servant offices, but like kind of still important, they would definitely encourage their kids to study. And I know that we, since we talked about our own family background, I know that I have family background just like that in the uh, 19th century, like people who make political careers coming from a peasant background. And what do their sons, again, mostly sons, but also some daughters take at least some sort of higher education. They, they kind of put their uh, kids to study. And uh, what do they study? They would study either to become a priest or to become a judge, because that was where these people had learned that's where the status and the possibility was if you really wanted your family to kind of increase uh, get how do you say get uh, a career in society these were the professions that kind of would uh, be where you could get the high status and so on so when you come to the late 18th century it would still not be a very open system but it, you will see more and more people coming with this kind of background into the higher education institution, in particular the University of Oslo and these studies uh, with a lot of prestige. Um, our uh, reading circle in the lodge just finished reading two volumes of, of um, I think the title is different in Norwegian, but the author is Lars Mitting. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, in English, it's... Uh, the Bell and the Lake, and uh, the Reindeer Hunters. Exactly. And I have not read them, but I heard about Lars Mitting, yes. It's wonderful books. Um, but they're historical novels, but a lot of them, a lot of the, a lot of, one of, one of the themes is the, the tenant farmers, the cotters, and the, how under control they are by the, by the person who owns the farm and owns their mm. land. 
And so I was wondering about the laws that might have, when did laws start or to, to change to protect them or make things a little better for their situation? Yeah, let's, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I know that they came, they, they become, in the second, as I said, like the for the tenant farmers or cutters, they, they it kind of peaked in the 1850s, and uh, by that time and after, it became kind of more a discussion about about their conditions. And uh, at some point, also the laws to protect them became it was introduced laws to protect them. I don't remember exactly when that happens, but I think it's also very important to mention that. A, a reason why this system kind of decreased after the 1850s has to do with this migration, uh, has to do with migration. That basically people are on the countryside, they are voting with their uh, feet, they, they, they move yeah. because they get, they then has the chance to move. I think in the 1860s also, the regul it was regulations about uh, that you basically needed a certificate from your priest if you wanted to migrate or move around in the country. This, these kind of laws are also being liberalized, so you don't need that. You can just take your feet and backpack and walk to the city, you know, and, uh, and then maybe if you can earn money, you can continue to go to America. And uh, there is also kind of this migration that, you know, some people from the middle class, they, they, they move to America and then people get a chance to take over their jobs and so that so I think that's um it's a very good question about question about the laws I don't I'm sorry I can't give you exact details okay. on that but uh, also basically that the structure and the migration in particular uh, are kind of making this system uh it's undermining this system basically Okay. A really quick follow-up question, if there's time. Um, no, if, please. If the people who migrated not to America, but to the cities, they were unskilled, I guess, most of them, or they were used to living in rural areas. What what did they find to do in the cities for their livelihood? Yeah. In, number one, they were not necessarily unskilled, because yeah. this is a very in interesting thing with, uh, with the tenant farmers because if you were a tenant farmer you would have a small plot of land you could grow you could maybe have one cow you can't live on one cow but you can get some milk so you would have a small piece of land and you can grow some vegetables and so on but not you cannot live of that land so to live the tenant farmers needed to do other things so some of them were laborers at other farms, but many did different kind of carpeting, carpenters. Uh, they could uh, do uh, things with like, uh, what's it called with skin, you know? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, to, to yeah. make things, yes. Uh, so, so many of them had different kinds of skills that they could use when they came to the cities. Of course, at, uh, in, when you go into the second half of the 18th century, also you gradually start, you're starting the process of industrialization where you get, basically get uh, jobs for uh, lay, pe people that basically can offer labor and you can train them to do things. But a lot of them also works in uh, all like professions to build houses because the cities were expanding. So you needed to build houses. You needed people to uh, do irrigation systems. Like you needed people with uh, skills to do to do things with their hands, basically. Thank so you. it was uh, it was kind of a big need in the cities. It was kind of a self um, a system that you know when a city is growing, you need people to come there and it, it creates new jobs. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions, please? <laughs> I, Did you I see a... when uh, when girls began to be taught how to read and write? I, I just found in my family history that my great grandfather, who was born in eighteen twenty. He, it says our grandfather Olsrud could read but could not write and did not read letters. Mm. When his children went to school, writing was taught to boys but not to girls. 
Randy had to beg her father to let her learn to write until he gave her permission. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting point. I think in principle, they should have taught them, also girls, to write after 1827. But, you know, locally, you know, things can have been... Uh, no, they lived it's, down. It's, it's a lot of things that can happen on a local level. They lived near uh, Kongsvinger. That was yeah. the area they lived came from. Yeah. No, but uh, but uh, what he said is uh, that uh, the father could not read letters, but he could read printed text, which kind of, again, makes kind of sense from what probably he had learned. Because, again, the, 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 the purpose of the old, very limited school system from 1739 was basically that people should read religious text. That meant text that was printed. And I don't know if any one of you maybe have if you do some uh, uh, that you do research in your own family history, you maybe meet uh, Gothic handwriting, like uh, older texts in Norwegian were printed in Gothic printed uh, print, which is you kind of get can get used to read it, but when you come to the Gothic handwriting, it's very different. <laughs> And uh, in Norwegians today, it's like a skill, you know, I uh, teach my students, I say like, oh, if you want to do history before 1815, like you basically need to know how to read this. And then they're like, no, 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 they don't, <laughs> they think it's too hard. <laughs> uh, but I, in, to a certain extent, I understand them. And if anyone of you have done it, you'll see that to read Gothic handwriting is, is much harder than to read Gothic print so i can kind of understand your great 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 grandfather that you could read printed text but not handwriting <laughs> along those lines um to be confirmed in the church say before 1850 w was there any educational value that was did you have to know did you just memorize scriptures and that's it or did you have to show some sort of proficiency or how did you get confirmed you uh you had there was there was some kind of teaching the priest and sometimes the assistant like this the sexton or vigor i think it might be called like the assistant of the priest could also be involved in the teaching of uh, the youth the young people before being confirmed uh exactly what it uh, they i think to a large extent it was basically that they they were the teaching was about uh, the text and i know that they had to memorize and they had to do usually in church they also needed before they were confirmed they uh, had to take a kind of public test like the priest basically would ask them questions uh, and they could uh they could uh, even fail, like pass or fail, if you didn't know the answer to the questions. And these questions, the way I, ha where I have understood it, I, 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 I don't know this very well, very very well. But the way I've understood it, I, I think that these questions they were pretty concrete, like kind of about the religious text, and maybe even that you should uh, memorize certain things and stuff like that. But. Uh, and you still actually do it uh, to a certain extent, uh, even though uh, when I was confirmed many years ago, uh, the, we got the questions in advance so I could uh, memorize the line I needed to uh, <laughs> say in church. And when my son was confirmed last year, I think they just did it with the, 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 the priest and the young. They didn't do it in public in church. They just had to memorize something in front or they had to have a small, they, they had kind of a presentation or something in the church and they didn't really have to memorize and get a question from the priest. So it, it has become kind of, uh, it's a different system today, which makes sense, like, you know, but the, the way I have understood it, it was uh, like kind of this thing that you, uh, you would get questions that were pretty concrete. I had uh, one other question where, talking about people moving from rural areas to a city and their skills. I was, I have someone uh, in my family who moved to Bergen for a time and he, in a census, he was called a merchant. And I don't really know what to think of that. 
a merchant. This was this would have been in the, about eighteen forty five fifty. Merchant, yeah. You think uh, what does it mean? What is the the profession in a way? Or well, is that mean he's cleaning fish, or is he a carpenter, or is he? I, I don't. No, if he if he's a mer merchant, uh, I think it will mean that he does some kind of trade. That he's a merchant. That he uh, that uh, it it's not specific, and you can say you can have merchants that are very wealthy and you can have merchants that are not very wealthy so it's a wide variety because there can be many kinds of trade people who run big businesses but it could also be people who have a small shop or something like that but a merchant will mean someone who is doing some kind of trade uh, but exactly it, it, it is not specific in what's what kind of trade the person is doing you know, so it could be selling tools, but it could also be selling uh, th things to eat. It, it could mean sure. many it's, things. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, of course, uh, population increase in the 19th century was the great driver of, first of all, the, the large number of tenant farmers and then the migration internally and, and across the sea. So what, what what drove the population increase? What, what were the causes of that? Yeah. Uh, the, the drivers of the population increase, uh, it, I think the main driver is that you, you see a reduction of uh, uh, mortality. Uh, and uh, and uh, you have uh, one... Uh, one uh, there are many reasons for that, but uh, you don't have like kind of uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, you had uh, had hunger in certain periods of time. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the the epidemic climate, like uh, different kind of sicknesses that uh, had been pretty common, becomes a bit. My, my, we talk about a milder epidemic climate that you don't see this. A lot of people die because of uh, uh, different kinds of epidemic. Uh, uh, happening. Um, you also have some. Uh, the government also take more kind of. Uh, they they involve themselves more in public health issues. For example, if it comes to ep ep epidemics, then they would try to isolate people, things like that. One reason that uh, has is all uh, very often um, uh, talked about is that you get also established. And that starts, I think, around 1800, uh, a system of uh, midwives. Mm. So, base, so most people, when you come into the 19th century, will have access to a midwife when they give birth, most women. Mm. And uh, this is, of course, extremely important because the f mortality rates of newborns were extremely extremely high another thing that uh, if, if you study this period and late uh, history 18th, 19th century and before that of course is that you will see uh, quite the numbers of women that dies in childbirth are it's pretty high it's uh, it's a lot of tragic stories about that uh, but you can say that all in all this uh, these uh, uh, these different uh, things, milder epidemic climate, uh, mo lesser mortality of children, um, uh, better, uh, like the, the not hungers, like the food supplies seems to work. It's also established, for example, uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, I think it is, and after that, they, they start establishing this local uh, grain uh, like they have they they have grain that they can if they if it's hunger they the 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 locally they would have stored grain so they could plant next year even if to make sure that they don't run out of it basically so there are a lot of these kind of mesh things that are done that basically stabilizes uh, also food supply mm -hmm. 
So I think the, the reason is kind of, it's not one spectacular reason. Maybe the most spectacular reason is the, can have to do with the midwives maybe, but I'm not 100% sure about that either. Mm -hmm. But they kind of together makes that the mortality rates, they fall. And, uh, and uh, that basically means that uh, the process starts when population start, starts to increase uh, more and more rapidly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it is. Uh, Joel, I think you're uh, muted. I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. You've given us an awful lot to uh, to think about. Uh, I've answered a lot of our questions. Uh, I'll give one more chance for anyone who wants to jump in with anything. But uh, otherwise, uh, let's thank uh, Jens. And um, I think uh, I think I'm safe in saying we'll we'll be happy to invite you back whenever you would like to come. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. It was uh, great uh, great to be here. I, I see here it's a few more questions. So let me just read. So that I have, uh, yeah, the, about the church confirmation, I, th I think we talked about that. Uh, I see. Uh, so, uh, and then smallpox vaccinations, it's also one thing that uh, comes, yes, has to do with healthcare and uh, mortality rates. Yes, thank you. You know, it's uh, late evening here in Norway. <laughs> so, uh, it was very nice to meet you all, and uh, you have a nice afternoon and Saturday. Thank yep. you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, shall I just log off then, uh, Joel? Is that okay? Sure. Or sure. No, that's fine. It's fine. Okay. Thank you. And thanks to the people in the in the lodge who made this first hybrid meeting a success. Uh, I should have mentioned that at the beginning, thanks to uh, Alexis Steen, uh, Carolyn Smith, uh, Henry Hansen, Greg Overbo. And I think that that means that uh, we, we can uh, do this again in the future if people would like to get together and meet in person at the, at the lodge. I don't understand what I do. Thank you very much. It was really wonderful. I'd love to hear from that young young man again. So it was it was delightful. It's, uh, it's one of the more academic talks that we've we've had, but uh, it's okay sometimes. Thank you for putting this together. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. Of course. Joel, do you want to mention about the next meeting? Uh, I did, but yeah, uh, uh, definitely uh, in March, March, I think it's March 25th, uh, Alexis Steen and I have agreed to uh, uh, do one of the first of these uh, presentations about our uh, ancestors who, who uh, immigrated to the United States. Uh, I finally remembered the name of the uh, pro uh, project that uh, uh, Christine uh, Maloney had a few years ago called the Roots Project. Now that's the one where people did this kind of thing, you know, one or two pagers on their on their immigrant ancestors, and then it went into a three-ring binder, and no one quite knows where the three-ring binder is. <laughs> so we'll make an we'll make a, 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 a an online binder. We'll make an electronic binder to keep uh, keep these stories in. Greg, I think uh, I think you're you're in charge here, so I think if you uh, 
you want to close the meeting, we can. Okay, uh, I think I know what happened with his slides too. We seem to have some sort of glitch with Zoom and PowerPoint. Okay. So if they try to run it as a slideshow, it gets stuck on the first slide. Okay. But I think there's an alternative that will work. I think it's uh, it'll do full uh, something like full screen or something like that. But we'll have to uh, give that a try next time. Okay, yeah, let's let's work on that. Uh, we can work on that in March when we do our yeah our, yeah. And, uh, we can uh, uh, see if we can then we can give advice to the speakers on how best to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, we'll add it to you to the draft of the instructions. Yeah. Okay. Oh, adios. See you, Joel. Bye. Bye.